All right, guys. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Kasia. I'm from GitHub. And today, with this amazing panel, we're going to talk about open source and some best practices, lesson learned, and so on. All right, so first question for you, um, guys. How do you classify your contribu contributors and um, how do you categorize people on your platform? Uh, do we want to do intros just, just, oh, uh, just uh, for context? I can, I, can start. I can start. I run marketing at GitHub. Hello. Uh, hey, my name is Ele. I'm the founder of Radical. Uh, Radical is a decentralized network for code collaboration built on the, pri on the principles of uh, sovereignty, neutrality, and censorship resistance. Hey everybody, glad to be here. My name's Sam. Uh, I work at the Ethereum Foundation, lead a small web development team. We primarily focus on ethereum.org. All right, so I will repeat the question. <laughs> How do you classify your uh, contributors? Well, I can, I can start. I mean, I think, uh, so on the, on the GitHub side, I mean, we, we think about the contribution funnel. Uh, in, in four steps, uh, where the, the, the first step is the, 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 the more the consumption and the use. Uh, most contributors start by actually using uh, the project. Um, and then it gets to contribution of time, where people contribute, uh, you know, fixes in the documentation, fixes in the, in the project. Uh, contributing code, uh, where you're actually fixing bugs and, and contributing and uh, more direct, uh, I guess, code. And then the last step is really kind of like maintain, where you become a maintainer, you onboard new members, you actually influence the strategy of the project and, uh, and become a part of the real the strategy of the project. So we're thinking about it in these kind of four steps. I think for Radical and generally Web3 communities, the situation is a little bit more messy, given that Radical is a DAO. Uh, you have the same roles pretty much emerging. Uh, you have maintainers and you have contributors. But of course, the difference here is that this is a self-governing network. So you have different people, you know, managing the treasury. You have different uh, teams actually, you know, acting in different roles uh, based on different uh, functions. Uh, so, so it's almost like a little bit more expansive to the maintainer contributor to also, you know, like, uh, you know, I wouldn't call this DAO politicians, but basically people that perform strategy and people that basically manage funds. Um, so, um, yeah, in, in general, the thing that we're trying to do with Radical is that we try to make this process with the DAO very simple, that you show up, you know, on our Discord or Matrix, you say something interesting, then something Someone reaches out and says, like, hey, you know, this is cool. Do you want to do more of that and get paid? Um, and yeah, I feel that that's the, the money component is the different, the main difference between some, some more traditional open source communities and what we see on Web3. Right on. Yeah. I think for Ethereum.org, it's probably a little bit simpler. Like, we don't, we, we're not a DAO. We don't have a token. We don't have hodlers. Um, I think some. Categorizations are cleaner than others. Like Ethereum.org is an open source website. It's available to anyone to contribute. Anyone can suggest changes, submit pull requests. I think, you know, from code access, there's a very clean distinction of like, we do have a core team of 10 people who have merge access on the repo and can deploy to the website. Um, we have hundreds of code and content contributors. We have thousands of translators who help translate content. Um, and we have a whole bunch of people who kind of straddle different lines between that. Um, so it does get blurred lines, particularly, you know, like is someone just in your Discord helping support others, helping guide other users? Um, we kind of consider everyone involved, even like the Twitter hecklers are contributors in their own way. Um, but yeah, I guess in short, varied. Yeah, and I also want to mention that um, people who contribute, right, there are different types of contributions. Some people just uh, watch, star your repo, read, look at it. Um, another way to contribute is pretty much um, propose changes on like documentation, like very high level type of changes. Um, another part of the contributors actually do the heavy lifting, right? Like they go in deep and make those push requests. And lastly, you have, like Sam mentioned, people who merge, right? Like the, this is where the governance happened. Like you give them permission to actually make those changes 
And I think that we can look at contributors from this level as well, where like roles, permissions, and also actions that are taking on the platform. All right, um, another question about experiments. What type of experiments to run to engage your audience, reward contributions, and incentivize them? And what are the lessons learned uh, through those experiments? Yeah, happy to chat from ethereum.org perspective. I mean, um, now that you've kind of seen, I guess, the different types of contributors, we've essentially just run a bunch of different experiments of like how to incentivize people, how to reward them, how to acknowledge them. Um, like I said, we don't have a token. You know, I'm one of the few people who gets paid to work on this, you know. Most of the thousands of people who contribute don't get paid in any way. Um, so that does raise some interesting questions of like how do you motivate people? Um, I think for some people, you know, it's as simple as like they just want to contribute to open source. They want to build their resume on GitHub and show that they're contributing to a repo or an organization that they're aligned with. Um, I mean, pull ops, I think, are one emerging um, kind of area with, you know, using NFTs to also kind of build a resume, build credibility and reputation in the space. Um, we have like 750 uh, pull op holders that seem to get motivated by that. Um, I'd say like one experiment that we've tried with, and I'd be curious to hear what other folks think, is just like ways to incentivize that are monetary versus that are not. Um, so like I said, we really don't pay the large majority of our contributors, but that's something we've considered. And you know, we're speaking at a Gitcoin sponsored event. Like when I joined the project early in 2019, we experimented with a lot of Gitcoin bounties. Um, and that was a great way to just like drive engagement and get contributions of like, hey, fix this bug, hey, build this feature, hey, write this page on this topic. Um, and I think it worked well in many ways in terms of just like getting the job done and shipping the thing. Um, but I would say on the flip side, it probably didn't drive a lot of like recurring con contributions. I think once you start getting paid to do a certain thing, it can change the motivations. And I think like mercenary is maybe too harsh of a word, but it did attract people who were just like, hey, I'm here to make a hundred bucks to, to fix this bug, yep. and then I'm gone. Yeah, uh, that's, that's absolutely, I mean, I'll say from a GitHub perspective, uh, I don't think we want to incentivize people um, to, I don't like the word incentivize, I think we should reward contributors, I think that's a healthy thing. Um, GitHub sponsors is an example of that where you can say, hey, I'm using this library and it's so useful, I'm gonna give you a few bucks and we're actually scaling that with organizations. But at the core, I personally believe that open source should remain like an intrinsic motivation, which is good for humanity and, and society. I think if you introduce incentives, then you start, I think, potentially like fucking that, right? Like I think it can be dangerous, slippery slope with people wanting and being here for the short term rather than the long term. Um, there's very interesting research showing that there's this book, Punished by Rewards, that shows that if you actually start introducing money in conversations about, an out, about a, a goal, the quality of the work is gonna decrease if it's, if it's for the money. So I think that we need to reward contribution because people need to pay their bills and we need to reward one, but I think there's intrinsic, there's a, ways to do that that's not monetary. For instance, uh, on GitHub, we have the GitHub Skyline program where we mail to big contributors their contribution graph uh, as a 3D printed object. And they're like, this is the best thing ever. They get like so much from that. There's stories where uh, on the .NET team at Microsoft, the people that contributed to the, to the open source project got mugs with the commit ID that was merging code base as mugs. These things that are more like physical and personal, I think carry more weight in the in belonging in a community and the long-term contribution from the community. Yeah, to add on that, I think it's a very interesting point and it's a long debate about like incentive, financial incentives, non-financial incentives. I think if we look at the history of open source, of open source, you will see that you know the first 
years of open source, it was a weekend thing. It was like the nerd thing. You only do it then. Then at some point, basically, you know, we started having these big open source projects. And in most of the communities of the bigger projects, you will see paid contributors, usually by corporations. And many times, this is kind of also behind the scenes. You know, it's like, okay, you getting paid, I'm not getting paid. And then I feel that like where the Web3 community is right now is that of course you see it's like the wild, wild west of, you know, financial incentivization where some projects have, you know, have a, uh, a token and then basically, usually what happens there is that the contributors are being rewarded long term and short term and teams playing with that. On the long term side, it's of course, you know, more like airdrops, one off or vesting of tokens. On the short term side, there are very interesting initiatives like Coordinate is one tool that you retroactively, you know, uh, reward uh, some of your contributors. Super interesting concept. Uh, we're developing one, one group within the Radical DAO is developing something similar where effectively you uh, put a bunch of tokens in a smart contract, and then um, when you uh, put a hash of the latest state of a project on chain, then effectively, you know, you can see who contributed, who contributed, who, which Ethereum addresses, and then these people can actually uh, split the reward um, in the end. So there's all sorts of, you know, interesting things going on. Uh, I think it varies per community, to go back to your point. It's some communities, you know, like introducing financial incentives messes everything up. Some other communities are native to money and then uh, introducing financial incentives actually, you know, drives, um, drives good action. Um, and then the final thing which uh, Thibault mentioned is that of course there are all of these other things. And I think the simplest thing, especially for open source communities and DAOs is someone shows up, has a, contribute, a contribution, then um, having a real person actually go and say, hey, I'm from the core team, thank you, this is really cool, or engage really quickly, really simply, you know, makes that person excited to keep contributing, right? Um, and a lot of the other initiatives that, that GitHub has been pushing. So yeah, some thoughts here and there. Yeah, and I also think that um, when we talk about rewards and incentives, it's very important to remember like the full picture is not just me contributing and getting rewarded at the end, but also you build on top of someone else's work. So recognizing and actually calling out that, hey, it's pretty much, I got this idea to fix this or implement it because I saw someone else doing similar things. So I think it's very important to have this collective um, recognition versus just individual recognition. And we also at GitHub see a lot of uh, feedback about sponsors program because developers technically uh, are very shy when asking for money from other developers, right? If you look at uh, tiers, I don't know how many of you sponsor another developer or use this program, but uh, people ask usually for like $5, $3, $10, which is like just pretty much a coffee money for the work that they are doing. And we learned that it's really the industry is changing, like you said, like a lot of industries or a lot of communities are motivated by different things. And uh, what we see at GitHub is actually open source community. They like to contribute because they are passionate about the project. And more like Sam, you said, um, it, they build their resume, they build their contribution graph, and they actually contribute to building better things, not necessarily getting rewarded with like, you know, money. But um, like I mentioned before, it's very important to, whenever we incentivize someone or give grants or something, making sure that it's, it's not just one person, it's like the entire team. A lot of people actually were in this cycle of development and if we incentivize, we have to make sure that keep that in mind. And actually, um, you know, there's a one story with the swag, right? Like swag is actually very nice to receive. Like Thibaut said, this, we sent um, to developers like personalized contribution graph, but also swag can be uh, sometimes misleading when you're like, hey, come here, I'll give you sw a swag, right? Like people might take it like, I would just take the swag and buy, right? So um, be careful how you utilize swag with your, you know, incentivization and rewards because it might help or might actually mislead uh, contributions on your platform. To, to add maybe another experiment that I, I saw and participated recently that was quite fascinating is within crypto is, is a project called developer DAO uh, where basically it's 
if for the ones of you that have seen the loot project where you had these non-fungible tokens with a bunch of attributes, uh, then one developer basically did the same thing, just generated a thousand of those cards basically that had you know a bunch of attributes like Vim and Haskell and you know call it, and then basically you could mint them uh, only by paying the transaction fees. And then what happened is that the com a community emerged, and then pe these people actually started contributing, right? So it, it went from nothing into something, almost at the genesis of it. And it's quite a wild organization, you know, it's, it's very interesting to, to observe. Um, so that's another type of um, incentivizing almost community creation, not just contribution. I totally agree. And uh, um, like I said, we open source is a huge community, right? And like there is like few percent of the people who are doing it because they're doing it for years and they never give up on like doing it and keep on like incentivizing them is so important as well. And like that they build that community. Um, and yeah, I, I think there is a lot of things we need to consider when doing it and creating new communities is so important as, as incentivization and rewarding people the same way. All right, guys. Let's jump to another question. Um, and how do you communicate with your contributors and what are the best ways and what did you learn works best for your particular, particular audience? Just give swag, that's all you need. Um, I think it's been continuous experiments and iteration on our side of things. Like, I mean, GitHub obviously is like a go-to for code collaboration. Um, I mean, having other channels where you can have, I guess, like different levels of discussion, we found helpful. Like sometimes people don't want to put a very well thought out proposal in a GitHub issue or on a Discord forum. Sometimes it's easier to give a Discord channel where you can have a more casual and synchronous conversation about things. Um, I'd say community calls has, has been one that I've been surprised by that like people actually want to show up and like join a live stream phone call and like, hear from some of the core maintainers or people working on specific initiatives. I think, especially in the world of remote work that most of us are in, like even having a human face on a screen or hearing a voice can give that extra connection. So if you are working on a project, even if you have 10 contributors or 10,000 contributors, like I do think, yeah, like finding creative ways to engage, join a community call, um, you know, have, Q and A's, whether that's synchronous or asynchronous, MAMAs, ask me anything. Um, that kind of stuff can definitely be helpful. One thing uh, you 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 make me uh, remind me is I think also doing um, doing these discussions uh, in public. I mean, yes, I think there's a lot of conversation that can happen in private uh, that are maybe you want to keep uh, keep private, but I think at the, at the core you want to have a lot of these conversations in the open so that you can actually have people discover your project. Uh, personally, I discovered a lot of projects by just researching, and then you find a conversation between two contributors, and you're like, oh, this is exactly something I was thinking about, or like a problem I have, or something. And then you realize that this, this discussion is actually related to a repo. Uh, so it, think about your also, in some ways, your, your marketing strategy, right? If you want to recruit, do these conversations in the, in the open because that's how people will find you. You might have from a conversation you're having with your contributors, the next contributor uh, coming and it compounds over time. So have a blend of both, right? Yeah, that, 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 that's actually a great point and it's something that uh, I've been observing a lot within DAOs. Um, within DAOs you have all sorts of flavors, right? You have more like, you know, a DAO which is basically a company at the center and a bunch of people around. You have things like, you know, like super chaotic things, but beautiful in my opinion, like developer DAO, right? So, and one of the things that I realized comparing the two is that actually the ones that doing it in the open, it's the, the information, um, uh, like basically um, the information communication, it follows a very different path rather than the more traditional, okay, now the CEO is speaking or the founder is speaking or whatever, you know. So, so first of all, like doing this in the public, like we constantly debate this, not debate this, but we constantly nudge people within the radical doubt that like, you know, please no private chats. We know that you're going to have private conversations, but please try to do this in the open if, you know, um, if there's no real reason to be in private. Simply because people show up, then it's super, you know, 
nice and easy for someone to engage. It's sometimes chaotic, of course, on the other side, uh, but you know, if you wanna be an open organization, that's, I think, a prerequisite. I agree, I think it's pretty, pretty instrumental just to get buy-in on that front, like the whole, you know, cathedral versus the bazaar, and right, I think we all agree the bazaar wins in the long run. Um, I've definitely made mistakes, I would say, like on that front, say like building a new page on ethereum.org, right? Like when to open up that level of discussion. And I think you could compare it to anything in open source, right? Like the person who just opens up the monster PR that touched 300 files and there wasn't any corresponding issue to this or like discussion or just like general alignment on what we're trying to accomplish. Um, we found similar things of like, if we just ship a page on like, hey guys, here's how to buy ETH. What do you think of the page? Generally the feedback we get is pretty muted and like not very engaged. Like the product's 90% built, like what can I critique at this point compared to taking the time which takes upfront investment, um, but I'd encourage projects to play around, right? Is like, you know, start the issue, generate the discussion, share early prototypes of the Figma file, get that comments and get that input early so that by the time you're like, you know, 95% done, people actually have been able to give input and it's like authentic input, not just like, hey, it looks good or like, this looks like shit, you should rebuild it, but it's too late for me to actually like give the harsh feedback I need to do. Yeah, I mean, in some ways you're, you're doing open source, but you're not actually, right? You're like, hey, I feel good. Like, how do you feel? Great, thanks for the non-feedback. We're shipping it, right? So I agree with you, it's a good point. Yeah, and, and, and the dark side of that is that many, um, people don't think about it like this, but many times it manifests into community development versus product excellence. Because yeah, of course it's a lot easier for someone, for the mastermind to actually go and say, well, you know, or maybe short term product excellence, because it's a lot easier for the mastermind to go and say, hey, this is the way and I'm gonna design it, ship it and that's it. But then of course when people co-create something, you know, they are a lot more engaged with it. Um, it, it just simple, it, it's like, you know, psychological, right? So, so definitely, you know, share early, embrace the fact that this is an open community and, you know, live with it and your community will likely grow, I think. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think it's very important to set expectations on what is the best way to have this communication. I know different communities, different teams, or even internally probably in your organizations will teams will use different ways to communicate. So I think it's very important to set the expectations. Hey, if we wanna discuss like a, a change or a problem, let's do it through this channel versus it's happening, some conversation happening on Twitter, some com com uh, conversation happening on uh, Discord and or Slack, whatever you're using, right? And then you have to pick up those pieces and like, hey, where did you hear that, right? So I think in order to have a good streamlined communication, there must be some a protocol or a standard way of how, when we have those type of discussions, where do we where do we take them, and who's gonna uh, who needs to kind of participate in those, right? Because if it's just like two friends talking and like, oh, we're gonna make this change, like you said, like where is the history? Where is like an issue, or where is that conclusion documented, right? Yep. So we have to make sure that as a community we uh, help each other by you know, by communicating in the same way as everyone else. And um, yeah, it actually helps a lot, like helps with the, for developers, helps for the product, and <laughs> just makes things faster and easier and like simpler. Exactly, it also simplifies your life. Uh, I was before 2017, I was working at a well-known uh, social network, Web2 social network, and at some point the CEO realized that basically the deck that I'm presenting to investors probably should be the same that I'm basically using internally because I don't want to be doing twice the work, right? So it, it's kind of that, that, you know, if you're building this in the, in the open, there's not the moment where you have to reveal yourself in the open and then deal with that process. It's just one communication channel and that's it, you know? Um, you don't need to do twice the work. All right, so I have one more question for you and then we open to um, the audience. So. What's your take on uh, scaling your community and considering uh, localization uh, for scaling uh, communities? Scaling community, um, good question. I mean, 
<laughs> with every answer I said, I feel like we're kind of making it up as we go. Um, but I mean, to give you some sense of at least our structure, like I joined about two and a half years ago and was basically the only person working full time on the project. Now we have nine full time people on it. Um, I mean, I think in scaling, it's like if you have the resources, one key is just recognizing the people who are making an impact and like empowering them to do more. So like whether that's giving them a grant, getting them paid somehow, um, or just like opening up their permissions and their access to do some, some things, um, even giving them maybe privileged access on your Discord, right? Like, you do need to put trust and accountability in people to like let them grow and step into a larger role. Um, I mean, organizational structure is a whole big question, but yeah, I think there are ways that you can let people fill in if they're taking the initiative. I th yeah, I think it um, depends on, on the audience uh, that you're trying to, 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 to target. I think, you know, at the, at the, if you're targeting developers, I think most developers do speak English because programming languages are in English. So I think localizing developer stuff like documentation and, and the core, uh, I'm not so sure. That's not where I would spend most of my time initially. I think when you're like a foundation or a product, a product or something more like where you're targeting maybe also uh, like the press, you're targeting like the, the entire community, not just the core developers. I think it's important to localize because that's your story, that's who you are, that's who you're the position. So, um, so I think I would say it depends uh, at level of scale. At the beginning, maybe if you're like really just targeting developers, I don't think it's necessarily, uh, it's a requirement as you scale at some point, it just makes sense to, to localize because it's your, it's your awareness, it's your story and you wanna, you wanna reach everyone. Yeah, I mean, completely agree. Shout out to, is Luca here? Luca Kropak, everybody. Um, helps us translate our website into over 40 languages. And like, he obviously doesn't do that alone. He helps maintain translator volunteers in the thousands who like literally just give their time to translate the website. Um, I think, Thibaut, you made a great point. Like it kind of depends, going back to the category of users of like, the importance of localizing. Like, if it's already a developer writing JavaScript, dealing with function and const and variable names that like relate to English, um, there is definitely barriers with like, you know, the issues and the PRs talking in English to some degree. Um, but as much as possible, right? Like, to give some context, Ethereum.org, you know, about 20% of our, our site traffic is to pages that are not in English. And like, that's still probably a fraction of what it should be if we think about just like the global audience of Ethereum and just how many people, how many billions in the world don't speak English. So right. it's a tough challenge, but like, I think the investments definitely pay off if you can, can do it. And yeah. you can automate a lot of stuff on GitHub. <laughs> Yeah, or please GitHub translate everything for us would be really great. Making a note. And maybe to add the Web3 native way for, for most of these communities, a lot of these things emerge again. So you show up on a DAO and you see all of these Leo towns on the left, usually, you know, Chinese, uh, Spanish, or whatever, right? So if your project is interesting, people will actually reach out and they will want to, to contribute again. Uh, so it's more about empowering those and um, from, from, from at least our own personal experience, again, like, you know, having a slightly lower bar, again, valuing community more than just excellence and like, you know, precision, you know, because indeed these people just got excited about your idea, they want to contribute, let them do it, and then work with them and, yeah, like basically raise the bar as you go. Um, yeah, I totally agree with you. Um, I think that's like a cool way to gain more, more contributors and actually let people uh, get interested in your project and help you out building the platform and building the community. So that's actually a very interesting aspect of looking at localization because not everything needs to be localized, but if people or developers or whoever in the community is willing to localize it on their own time because they're passionate about it, I think that's a great way to get more contributors and actually increase your audience of users and participants. So 
Um, yeah, I, I think definitely depends like what is your priority, who you're targeting, and if you can open source that and let the community to help you out, I think that's a great way to start with. Yep. All right, um, so we will take now questions from the audience. And please use this microphone right here. Josh, you have a question. <laughs> wow, on the spot. Wow. <laughs> Um, when are we going to see a GitHub DAO? You have it. <laughs> Check out radical.network. Hey. Oh, I've been put in my place. <laughs> yeah. um, I would love to have GitHub DAO. And um, for, for GitHub, pretty much it's open source, right? So we give a lot of things and ways for community contributing, contribute and manage code. Um, it would be very challenging, for speaking from GitHub, to create a DAO because there is a lot of like technical aspects behind it. So it's an effort that we will have to prioritize versus prioritize some other features and building more efficiency for developers, right? So hopefully, you know, we would love to have it, but I think like from the investment part and cost, I think this is something that we can talk about probably in a few years. But right now, we're helping you guys and helping standardizing DAOs, so, uh, yeah, <laughs> you guys have, you know, radical. <laughs> I mean, to, just to add, to add the point, uh, I think um, the problem with a lot of Web 2.0 web companies trying to basically transition into a Web 3.0 company is that there are all of these assumptions that are there in their infrastructure, and going away from that is not a, a trivial thing, or is not many times something that the incentives align. Uh, practically, just going through the, the the story of like trying to build radical, we had to literally, you know, reimagine a lot of those things. You know, instead of server-side um, user credentials, you have public-private key cryptography, right? Uh, and then instead of one centralized server, you have a swarm of nodes and a bunch of cryptography that allows you to consume content with with confidence. Instead of you know again server server-side um, org management, we have multi-sigs and smart contracts. Instead of traditional financial rails, you have Ethereum and all the beauty that's happening there. So it's, it's really not a trivial thing. And then the other thing that we're discussing with Casa before is, of course, it's also crypto is a divisive thing for a lot of open source communities. Uh, it's not, and maybe Casa, it, it would be great to hear from you, but I think crypto within some open source communities is seen as a negative thing. Like they actually think that this is scam or whatever, right? So that's always the difficulty that big web 2.0 platforms will face if and when they consider making this transition, I think. I totally agree. And I think we talked about it a few minutes ago where unfortunately um, there is a lot of like negativity about uh, around crypto and how web 2 companies see crypto being something very bad for them because even at GitHub we see a lot of abuse of miners using GitHub actions and GitHub needs to take the cost, right? So if you think about it from this perspective, we are not helping to create more DAOs because actually there is some kind of negative negativity behind it. I think in order for Web2 companies to start adopting DAO, there must be a change in the reputation and also like re reliability of the DAO and so on because there is a lot of problems, right? I think it's unavoidable to have more, DAO, more Web2 companies creating DAOs, but I think it's still early. Um, we are still early, and there is a lot of things that needs to be fixed and standardized, and the trust needs to be built, right? Because a lot of people, like I said, um, they are very skeptical to do that. I know co some companies are like m moving completely, transitioning to become a DAO, but I think for companies like GitHub or other Web2 companies, it will take some time. It does make me wonder, just riffing here, of like what baby steps might be possible. Like, totally get GitHub's not just gonna launch a DAO tomorrow. Like, there's technical risks, there's regulatory risk, there's a lot of open questions, but like, you know, could GitHub start running IPFS nodes and start running some radical seeds, like, as a way to kind of dip the foot in the water, if you will? Like, I think it's encouraging to see some, you know, larger companies already experimenting with that, and like maybe that's, you know, maybe yeah. we chat after and 
figure I mean, out yeah, I mean, we, we came here as a group to, to, to learn, connect. I mean, yesterday we were having drinks with the community and hearing what the tools they use and how they use the platform. Um, we think there's, there's interesting opportunities, but we, we want to continue to learn. We've been talking, I mean, and it's great to see that the Web3 community is already using the platform. I mean, I see people using VS Code, I see people using uh, GitHub and GitHub Actions for automation, and so the platform is already in some ways enabling a lot of the Web3 innovation. Uh, but how do, we, how do we push the envelope is something we need to continue observing and connect with the community, so, uh, and we're doing that right now. And I, I think, Josh, you have a, like a big mission here because um, <laughs> to do here because in order for Web2 companies to become a DAO, there must be some phase approach or testing approach where they actually can experiment that if, if it works for their model and their audience. So actually, there is a lot of work to be done on your guys' end to make sure that, hey, you, you provide tools and services for uh, public companies to become a DAO. I don't think we are there yet. I think there is a lot of like experimentation. It's like super like alpha early stage of like product and for companies like GitHub it's a huge risk because there is a lot of uncertainties, right? So I think you guys can help us to get on the right path. <laughs> I, I think oh. I just want to say that uh, I just want to I just want to say that uh, I love that the answer to my question is go answer your own question. <laughs> I think just to add one more point on that, if you, if you play the 10 year old view or the 100 year old view, I have no idea when that will happen. Um, what you might see is that somehow the world is m moving away from the Western world, right? And okay, you know, one global power already, you know, we are in this, you know, new Cold War in a way between China and the US. And the challenge with some of this Web 2.0 infrastructure and, you know, the censorship that comes with it is that. You know, today, yes, you, maybe you're not Russian, maybe you're not Iranian or whatever, right? So suddenly you might not lose your resume, your salary, your contributions, whatever that is, right? But then if you play that model out 10 years out and 20 years out, what if the new superpower doesn't like, you know, what we're all doing here in the West, right? So then you probably need something that is completely different engineered and relies on true peer-to-peer -peer technology and you know, avoid this dichotomy of who can, who should be, who should be censoring the corporation or, or the state, you know, what if it's the users themselves, right? So, yeah, just a while. All right. We have uh, time for one more question. So who is the lucky one? <laughs> if not, oh, here we go. Hear me? Um, how can GitHub or Radical help open source design? Can you please repeat? <laughs> how could GitHub or Radical further help open source but with design instead of code contributions? So it's a good question. I mean, um, I think, I don't think we have an answer to that today. I think right now, one of the things that GitHub we just did is we're getting into actually if you think about GitHub historically, it's been you know helping with source code management, and then obviously now providing automation, CI, CD, and now we're actually getting into code authoring with Code Spaces, that lets you actually basically code on the cloud, which uh, is I think uh, pretty pretty amazing. But I think if you think about the end-to-end -end, uh, journey of a, of a developer, design is also I mean you mentioned Figma, it's also part of that. Um, Could just buy Figma. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, I guess I'd say, like, I'm glad to see it's already come a long way. Like, I think the whole, like, CI, CD capabilities to, like, have a preview deploy where a designer right. can at least be, you know, playing right. ar around with some CSS, like, throw together a prototype, have a deployed instance of an application that you right. can play around with and touch and feel. Like, that alone is big. But right. it's, a, it's a great question. I think design is a... It is, it, is, it, area. it is, if you think about, yeah, that's a great point. It's like, up front, if you think about the step before code authoring and during the entire end-to-end, -end, design is part of that. Um, uh, it's it's kind of interesting to see that Figma, I think, positions themselves as kind of like the, the GitHub for design. Um, uh, there's a lot of similarities in how, how they think and even from a product experience. So, um, yeah, um, that's something that's very interesting to continue thinking about for us. 
Yeah, I, I, I want to be honest that we're not thinking about design right now, at least not yet. We have bigger, like, bigger problems to solve in order to be able to provide a decentralized alternative uh, to GitHub for developers. Um, but it's definitely a, um, a fascinating question and one that within the Radical DAO, you know, we 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 asking ourselves that question like okay you know this is an open organization how do we go about also open sourcing our design so what we've been doing is within our um, community our forum which is radical.community uh, then there are posts about the design process and um, yeah we're trying to sharing more but we're not productizing anything yet I respect and encourage your focus <laughs> I think the problem space is like big enough for now appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you so much, guys. And um, it was great to chatting with you. And if anyone has any other questions, feel free to chat we'll us. We'll be around. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.